All right. Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, uh, give me a, a thumbs up in the chat or just say we can hear you or we can't hear you. Just want to make sure um, you can hear me and everything looks good here. So I'll wait here just a second. Cool. People can hear me. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. There's no debate going on tonight, <laughs> which uh, which is good. Maybe we'll have a little bit more uh, people jump on here, um, and saves us from some of that uh, that chaos that was happening. Um, so I am trying out something new that kind of puts uh, the comments a little bit closer on screen. So um, we'll see how this works out here. But um, I'm going to wait just a minute or two more. And then we'll go ahead and dive into some questions that you have. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, welcome everyone who's here. Super excited that you uh, showed up and took some time tonight to uh, spend here asking some questions. So feel free to ask whatever you'd like to know about buying a house, uh, getting a mortgage, selling a home, and we'll just spend the next uh, maybe hour, hour and a half. Usually ends up being two hours <laughs> talking through um, some of the ins and outs here. So T Anderson, you said, Hey Kyle, I'm purchasing a new build townhome in Maryland for four hundred thousand. I want to rent out the basement to make my mortgage more affordable. Do you think this is wise? Um, so I think that's a perfectly acceptable option. Something that you might look at as well. So you're renting out the the bottom, the the basement. Um, the hard part is going to be, does that like do they have a kitchen or are they sharing a kitchen with you? Um, do they have I imagine there's a bathroom down there. I feel like the living situation could get a little strange. What might what you might look at doing is uh, if you've lived in that home for a year, you can actually move out of it, rent the whole thing, and then go purchase a new primary residence. That might be a little bit of a, a better solution, at least in my mind. I don't really want to share a home with somebody. <laughs> um, in college, I lived with five other guys, and that was a nightmare. So um just from personal experience, that's what I, I would do. But yeah, perfectly acceptable to do that, especially if it's going to save you some money. Um, Linda, you said, hey, Kyle, love your videos. Thank you. Uh, for the VA loan, I went on the VA website to look at what condos are approved. If none come up in my city, does that mean none are approved? So um, yes, if you look on the VA's condo lookup website and there are uh, no condos showing up, then there's no condos in that area that are actually VA approved. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use a VA loan on a condo. What it means is you're, you'll are you have to work with your lender to submit a, uh, a request to VA um, to get that condo approved. So the condo association has to now work with VA to get the VA approval. So first, the condo association has to be willing to do that. The problem is most condo associations don't care. Like they won't submit for FHA or VA. Uh, condo approval. So this is frustrating um, for people who are wanting to look at condos with these government loan options. Um, so, and the reason why they do it is just because they they think that, you know, well, we can just go get a conventional buyer for this um, anyway, especially if it's a smaller condo association and not like one big management company. 
So you do have the option of submitting that to VA to see if it's possible for that condo to get approved. There are requirements that the condo has to meet, like how much reserves they have in the bank and um, insurance requirements as well. Uh, I don't know this off the top of my head, but talk with your lender about that if you'd like. Um, and it might be easier just to explore a conventional loan because that process, even if the condo association meets the guidelines, it could take months to get that approval back from the VA because they're not the fastest. <laughs> um, all right. Just looking through some more questions here. So uh, I am new but willing to start investing. Uh, do I need to have IRS taxes for real estate investor? Um, I think I'm a little confused on the question. Are you are you asking, do you have to file taxes? Um, because you would need to file taxes if you were investing. Um, if you could clarify that question for me and uh, I'll see if I can answer it here in just a sec. Um, Louis, Luis, uh, you said, hola, Kyle, hola. Uh, thank you for everything. You're welcome. Quick question, my $400,000 offer just got accepted in LA. And we're currently in escrow. Any red flags to watch out for during the underwriting phase? Um, no, like red flags that I would watch out for. The main thing that you want to kind of keep in mind with the uh, the underwriting process is just having good communication with your loan officer um, or your processor, or whoever's whoever you're working with with the lender. So. I would just stay in touch with them maybe once a week. Hey, is there anything that we need to do? Anything that we need to get for you? Um, because lenders right now are really backed up. And so it's helpful when you have a buyer or a borrower who uh, wants to be helpful in the process. As loan officers, a lot of times we run up against everyone fighting against us because we're asking for documents and you know I don't wanna ask for documents, but it's required. And so if you're willing to kind of take a step ahead and see how you can help out, the loan officer um, or the processor during that, I think that's going to be super helpful for you. And they're going to be honest and upfront with you if you are with them. So that's mainly what I would keep in mind there. Um, and one quick thing. So the way I have the setup, I actually have a teleprompter in front of me that shows me your comments while I look into the camera. So I don't know if that's weird or not. Let me know like <laughs> in the comments, if it's weird that I can read the comments while I'm looking at you, um, I don't know. Uh, I've just found it. I was trying to get away from doing the whole like looking up and looking down kind of thing. Um, so yeah, let me let me know how that looks or if that looks super strange. Um, Linda, you said not weird. Okay, cool. <laughs> I don't want it to be like super weird, like I'm just maintaining eye contact the entire time. Um, JH, you said I've been hearing about a program called NACA. NACA, I'm not sure how to say it. Um, can you speak toward it specifically what your opinion about the program is? Honestly, I have very little um, knowledge about uh, NACA or NACA, how, however you say it. From my understanding, it's a program for specific regions, um, for like specifically qualified buyers. So there's kind of a tight box that you have to fit into. Uh, and they, it's like a training program or a course of sorts. It seems like it's like a couple weeks long. And then at the end you qualify for one of their programs. Um, and it seems like it's kind of similar to down payment assistance or some sort of assistance. I'm not really sure. I need to do some more research on it. NACA, NACA is not common in my area. So I have no experience with it. Um, and even if it was, it's not a loan program that like I can work with as a lender, only there. Um, I don't know if they have approved lenders or if they work as themselves as a lender. It's a little unfamiliar for me. Um, and it seems like it's a pretty polarizing thing. Um, like some people love it, some people hate it. So um, it's hard to say, I wish I had a better opinion for you. Um, Jen, you said, I need the seller to cover my closing costs. Should I offer uh, asking price to better my chances? Um, yeah, so if you're going to ask for closing costs uh, covered by the seller, then you want to make your offer stand out in a different way. So when we ask for closing costs, that kind of drops us down a couple points. Like, right, if we, if we imagined the 
our offer was here. When we asked for closing costs, it kind of knocks it down. It's not as attractive anymore. Okay, it went from a nine to now it's like a seven. And we wanna bring that back up to a nine or a 10 in terms of like how attractive this is to the seller. So if we also have a low price along with asking for closing costs, the seller is gonna think, eh, this isn't super great. Um, but if you ask for a higher price with closing costs, then they might net out the same amount of money and be willing to uh, accept your offer. Um, Josh, you said I was going to use the USDA no down payment program. Do you know anything about this program? Yeah, USDA is an awesome loan program. I think the highest viewed video on this channel is about USDA loan requirements, which is funny because it's the most most boring, <laughs> most boring 10 minute video you'll probably watch in a long time. Um, and it's funny because I know like I've made a few loan requirement videos and uh, it's been funny to hear like, you know, people that I talk to around here who are like, why in the world are you spending time making videos about loan requirements? I'm like, I'm pretty sure a hundred thousand people have watched this video so far. Um, so USD is fantastic. Um, there are only four rural areas. Now, when you think of rural, don't immediately think farmland because that's not true. USDA's version of rural depends on the population size. So normally any um, any like relatively small city usually qualifies for USDA. Uh, and there's if you Google USDA eligibility map, you can type in an address and see where it's el where you're eligible and where it's not. But it is truly zero percent down. Um, you also have a, a funding fee of 1%. So if you're taking out a $200,000 loan, uh, they're going to charge a funding fee of $2,000 uh, $2, wrapped into the loan. So 1%. So you're actually taking out a $202,000 loan. Um, their mortgage insurance is very cheap, uh, but it does stay on the life of the loan. Um, they are harder to qualify for than FHA loans, but easier to qualify for than conventional um, they go down to a 500 credit score. Something cool about a USDA loan that most people do not know about, and it's the coolest back pocket trick <laughs> uh, as a loan officer, um, where let's say your purchase price is $200,000 and the property appraises for $210,000. You can actually take out a loan for the closing costs for up to $10,000. It's the only loan program that allows you to pull out a loan up to the appraised value and not just the purchase price. Um, so they're, they're really cool loans. Um, I would definitely look into seeing if you can qualify for one. And they normally have really good rates as well. Uh, their USDA rates are very similar to FHA rates, um, which right now I would expect you're looking at the uh, you know low three to high 2% range, depending on your credit score. <laughs> uh, Adam, you said the only worthy debate is 15 versus 30 year fixed. Um, yes. And I have a, I just made a video on the 15 versus 30 year, uh, that is, was mind blowing to me because I've always heard about people talking about doing a 30 year and investing the difference. Um, but when I actually did the math on it, it was like a difference of like 200,000, was it 200,000, maybe less than $200,000 over 30 years. Um, crazy. So might be worth looking into if you want to do that 30 year and invest the difference. <laughs> John, you said the symmetry in this vid thus far is impeccable. Awesome. So I'm so glad to hear. On my end, I feel a little bit like a, uh, a crazy person because like my computer screen is up here uh, in front of the camera. Like, and I have a teleprompter, so I can't actually see my camera. All I see is it looks like I'm looking at your comments. Um, but the hope is that I'm not doing the back and forth shift the entire time. Um, Jose, you asked, uh, you, or you said, hi, Kyle, our lender ran our credit today for a pre-approval and our credit scores were at 700 and 680. We wanted to give 3% down for a conventional loan, but said our scores are too low. Interesting. Um, it wouldn't be that your scores are too low necessarily, but maybe your debt to income ratio is uh, too high to get that. So the hard part 
um, is that most loans are written through underwriting software and the big enterprises that create the rules for the, this uh, software and for under like mortgages in general, um, they don't tell us all the ins and outs of how it works. So for instance, as, as a loan officer, if I was running your, uh, your specific loan file through this program and I put in 3% down, it would come back and say what's called a refer ineligible. All right, that's what the software says when it comes back when you're not approved. Um, and it doesn't tell you really why. It just gives these vague answers. It doesn't say like, hey, if you increase your down payment to 5%, then you could get approved. It just says, mm, nope. Uh, and it makes it really hard as loan officers because we can't give clear answers all the time onto exactly why you didn't get approved. So 3% down on a conventional loan does sometimes make it tricky. Um, the underwriting software tends to be a little bit more strict when you're doing 3% down versus 5% down. Your credit scores are on the higher end. So I would think maybe helping you get down to 3% uh, down, you probably either need a lower debt to income ratio um, or you might need some reserves in the bank. Just a thought on the top of my head. Again, you, it'd have to be run through the underwriting software um, and it sometimes feels like, I don't know, the underwriter underwriting software wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, divine speech, you said, I'm 14. I don't know what I'm doing here. Man, I don't know what you're doing here either, but I guarantee that give it a few years and I'm sure you'll be a, a real estate mogul if you're learning stuff at 14. Um, I don't know. I definitely was not watching home buying videos when I was 14. <laughs> Maybe I should have. Um, Genesis, you said, have you heard of the Bank of America $17,500 incentive or 10,000 goes to down payment assistance and 7.5,000 goes to closing costs? Um, if so, can you elaborate your thoughts on this incentives or on this incentive or downsides? Um, I have not heard about this. Um, the main thing that I would want to look into with all down payment assistance programs is are you getting a higher rate? than if you didn't get the assistance. And is there are there any strings attached to the down payment assistance? Um, the most common one is a lot of down payment assistance programs don't allow you to refinance or to uh, sell the home within a certain period of time without giving back that assistance. So I would make sure those aren't there. And then I would go ahead and shop with a couple other lenders just to see those options um, and what uh, what's there for you. Um, currently I'm lurking, learning how to program some software, which is becoming a larger undertaking than I initially anticipated, um, that where you could actually like plug in two loan estimates and it will tell you which one is the cheapest option over a period of time. Um, so that's sometime in the future. Hopefully I'm able to build that soon. We'll see. Justin, you said, uh, hi, Kyle, appreciate your videos. You are very knowledgeable. Thanks, Justin. I really appreciate it. And thanks for watching. Um, David, you said once you're approved for an FHA loan, how long is it good for? Normally, it's going to uh, last about 90 days, and that's how long it takes for your credit report to expire with a lender before you need a new report uh, pulled. Sandra, you said, hello, what exactly shows up on a CAVERS report for FHA loans? So a CAVERS report, um, let's see if I can remember the acronym. I cannot remember the acronym. It's dumb. I hate acronyms, <laughs> but uh, CAVERS is basically this database that shows anybody who's in default of federal debt. So if you have a student loan that you're in default, it's going to be on, on CAVERS. Um, and it's basically just a warning system uh, database for the government. Whenever the government is going to extend loans, like an FHA loan, um, then they're going to pull a CAVERS report and see have you do you have any delinquent federal debt so what exactly shows up on there i can't say because um only an underwriter has access to cavers as a loan officer i can't actually pull a cavers report they don't give me access to that um you have to have uh, some certification to be able to actually see in those reports um but what i do know is that if you do have any uh delinquent federal debt it will show up in CAVERS and you need to get on a payment plan to take that out of uh, a CAVERS alert 
And you won't be able to get an FHA loan unless you have a clear CAVERS report or you get on an established uh, repayment plan. Um, Kyle, you said, or yeah, you said, Kyle, I make $500,000 a year at age 33. 500,000, that's awesome. Uh, how much home should I buy? I have a wife and a son. So that's up to you. Just because you can afford a large house doesn't mean that you should. Um, when it comes down to how much should I buy, uh, that is 100% up to you. There's no magic rule in my mind that um, can give you the right answer. Uh, when it comes to the question, how much could I buy? That's an easier question to answer because um, lenders have specific uh, math equations that help you see how much you could buy. And, you know, I have a mortgage, a max purchase price Google sheet that you can download um, if you want to see how much you could. But when we're talking about how much you should, that brings in the question of your budget, because I don't know the rest of what you, you pay for, um, right? Like, are you also putting a lot into savings and retirement? If so, that's going to cut down on how much you should pay on your mortgage. Um, what most people say is 25% of your take home pay max going towards uh, a mortgage and that's principal interest taxes and insurance now that's probably going to buy a pretty large home for you um, because i mean what five hundred thousand uh time i'm taking out taxes divide by 12 times 0.25 i mean you're that would be like five to seven thousand dollars a month on a mortgage payment uh, if you need a house that big, go for it. <laughs> um, but just because you can, that doesn't mean you have to, um, you could always throw that money into, into savings and have a really nice sum of money, uh, here in the next few years. Uh, Tony, you said, what are the rules for USDA loan inside the house? Like wood floor is okay or no? Yeah. So USDA loans along with like, uh, all government loans, FHA, USDA, uh, VA, they want um, a, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, they want floor covering. So wood floors, perfectly fine. Um, as long as the, the wood floors, you know, are in good shape, like there's no holes in the wood floors that are going to be a tripping hazard. Um, all government loans are concerned about is health and safety. So as long as the floor is safe to walk on, you'll be good there. Um, and you need a floor covering. Um, yeah, this is probably the bad thing about having this up here is you just see me looking directly at the camera, <laughs> but, um, I'm reading comments right up here. So let me see here. Okay, so it looks like NACA gives grants to help with down payment, but they also expect you to do volunteer work even after you close in order for it to remain a grant. Interesting. Okay, so you have to continue to do work after you receive the money. Um, I'd be interested to see what happens if you don't do that work, if they require like repayment. Because if it's uh, a grant wouldn't need to be repaid, but if they convert it to something that needs repaid, that would be... Um, that would be brutal. Uh, Jesse, you said we have been in contract and approval for our first home since June. Uh, new construction uh, with a closing estimated for 1030, um, which is, isn't that soon? Isn't that like three days? Uh, 1023, they said there's a delay in processing and might miss closing. Is this common? Um, it is common. Uh, especially in this strange COVID world, it seems like everything's been thrown out of, you know, <laughs> out of control. Um, what I would maybe ask them is, uh, like, could they clarify a little bit of what's causing the delay? Um, and is there anything that you can help with in that process? Sometimes it's just dumb bureaucratic stuff that holds up closings. Um, you know, for instance, like I was going and getting uh, like a a wire instructions from a title company corrected today. Like that in of itself took a day to hear back from the title company to get. So it's dumb stuff like that. 
that can sometimes slow down closing. And it's things that are just completely out of your control, right? Like I called a title company last night and it's literally takes a day for them to create a new document with a different number It's a little ridiculous, but um, sometimes it's just little things. Uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about it, but it's definitely worth talking with your loan officer and seeing um, uh, if, if there's anything that you can help with there. Uh, Justin, you asked, are there any resources you can point me to about manufactured homes? Um, and land included, no HOA fees. I was planning to refinance, but it seems better to deal better deal to buy this other house in the neighborhood. Um, manufactured homes specifically uh, aren't an issue. You're going to, like with a manufactured home, you're going to purchase it almost exactly similarly to any other loan. Um, the only thing that you want to watch out for is what kind of manufactured home is it? Because manufactured is like this general category and you have all these little categories beneath it. So manufactured, technically underneath manufactured is mobile. So like, was it a single wide? Was it a double wide? Uh, is it currently, is it permanently attached to the land? A lender wants to make sure it's permanently attached to the land. Um, and if it was at one point an actual vehicle, because if it had wheels on it, it technically has a vehicle title to it. Um, it's not a home, it's a vehicle. Uh, you need to have, make sure it has the HUD tag number on it and the serial number still on it, um, even if it's still permanently attached. So I don't have any particular resources for manufactured homes, um, but you'd want to explore a little bit of like, what's the history of this manufactured home um, to be able to get a, a better idea of it here. Um, Marvi, you asked, what happens after pre-approval? What if we didn't find a house within that time frame? So after pre-approval, you have that time to go and shop for um, a shop for a home. Normally, this is about ninety days. It's about how long it takes your credit report to expire. Um, and if you don't find a house after that, that's perfectly fine. So you don't have to, um, in my mind, like re get re pull credit with a lender. As long as you don't have any big changes that have happened, then you're going to be fine, right? If if you end the 90 days and then it takes you another month to purchase a home, you can then just reapply when you get closer to that stage. I don't think you have to keep repulling every 90 days. Uh, Justin, you said, I'm literally submitting the offer as I listen to you. That's awesome. Um, well, best of luck. Uh, let me know. Let us know if you hear anything because I know sometimes uh, everything moves pretty quickly, um, especially in this ridiculous market. <laughs> Um, okay. So I want to become a real estate investor as any other business. Do I need to have taxes? Oh, okay. Like an EIN number specific for a real estate investor. Um, no, you don't. So as a, as a real estate investor, like you can purchase and close those homes in your name. Now, if you're going to close them inside of an entity like an LLC, then you will need, um, most of the time an EIN number to be able to open and operate that LLC properly. So um, what I would first do is I would first just close those, you know, the, the first ones since you're starting out, um, close them in your personal name. That's going to be the easiest. And then you can do a quick claim deed into an LLC when you get that started. Um, and also look like explore why you want to do the LLC. Um, the LLC in the beginning isn't going to be super helpful except in like a in some elements of like if you get sued but even then you're going to have a not as much protection as people think you do um you still have like full obligation <laughs> right so uh maybe explore that with either an attorney um or an accountant to see if that's an option that's worth it um in this stage in the process um, Jose, okay, so we're going back to your question about uh, you said you weren't approved for three percent down. So you said you need seven sixty or higher. Um, yeah, I would try another lender. Um, there's no rule that says you need a seven sixty or higher to get three percent down. Um, I guess I don't know. Maybe that's something internal that they have. Uh, but yeah, I would I would maybe try another lender. Um, hello, Kyle. What does being a police officer help with buying a house? So there are some programs um, called, 
what's it called? It's uh, let me look this up. The hero next door. Heroes next, yeah, heroes next door dot org. And I think this is a national program. Um, I'm trying to see who this qualifies. Yeah, so police officers, military, although if you're in the military, if you're a veteran, I would just go for a VA loan instead. That's going to be a better option. Um, that doesn't tell me. But yeah, look into that program. That's one that I'm, I've heard of. I don't know much about it, to be honest with you. But with all of these special down payment assistance programs, I would always look at other offers as well and make sure that you're not going to get stuck into something that's giving you money up front, but it's going to cost you more money in the future. Um, so always compare that with other options that you can uh, you can explore in your area. Uh, Shonda, you said I have 20% saved for home, but nervous about buying because I live in a high cost of living area and home prices are inflated. Um, I'm concerned about catching a falling knife. Any advice or tips? Um, yeah, yeah. So this is a common problem that a lot of people are having. Um, and I don't have super helpful advice, I don't think. Because I have a video that I'm working on right now that, that's kind of talking about this super high cost problem. And there's no solution uh, that you can, you know, there's no like easy, quick remedy. What I would first ask is you have you have this money saved for a home. Okay, and if it's a high cost area, I imagine it's a pretty large chunk of change. Um, what I would first want to see is, do you have most of your high interest debt paid off? If so, I would take care of that first. Um, that's going to save you more money than than purchasing something in a high cost of living area. Um, something else to be careful of is in some of these high cost of living areas, we're seeing appreciation skyrocket um, at an astronomical pace. Uh, like I think I was hearing it was was it LA that had like a 9% appreciation um, annualized over this past month, uh, which is crazy considering like appreciation is normally running four to 5%. So it kind of begs the question, like you're mentioning is like, are you purchasing near the top and then things are going to come down? Um, the way it looks right now is we're probably eventually going to have a market correction in the next year or so is what I would estimate. Um, now, don't take my word for it, but because uh, it's entirely speculation, I don't think we're going to see a crash, but I think we'll see a correction. All markets are going to go up and they're going to go down. Right now, we're seeing a bit of a bubble happening um, where there's very little homes. It's skyrocketing the price. Mortgage interest rates are low, so we have a lot of buyers out. Uh purchasing a ton of homes. There's not a lot available. So home values are high and expensive and that's going to eventually flip. Okay. It always does. Every market does. If it doesn't flip, we have a huge economic problem and I just don't see that being an issue. So if you have the patience, personally, what I would do is I would wait. You have cash. Uh, I would see, you know, is there an option that maybe you can pay off some debt, keep some savings, and then maybe look at exploring investing a little bit. Um, that's an option. But I personally would want to hold out just a little bit longer to see what's going to happen with with these prices here. Um, but again, don't take some guy's opinion from the internet. <laughs> uh, it's just my opinion. Um, so do some extra research into that and see what's going to be most comfortable for you. Uh, John, you said 720 score, zero debt. Gross income is a 121 veteran, but we're nervous about getting into rental income. What are some pitfalls? Um, so do you, I'm guessing you mean like starting rentals, uh, like purchasing a rental property and receiving rental income. Um, as far as pitfalls, you're mainly just talking about like, uh, I imagine like what problems you have with tenants. Uh, if you could like clarify that for me, and then I'll, we'll circle back to this question. Um, Lisa, you said, I heard a couple of banks are requiring insane credit scores right now. Uh, yeah, some banks are requiring a lot higher credit scores. I think Chase at one point was requiring like a 720 credit score and 20% down. And it was like some level of reserves as well, um, which is which was ridiculous. <laughs> um, not all are like that. Shop those around. 
because I still know lenders who are lending all the way down to a 500 credit score. Now that's not a pretty loan to do. It's not a fun one. Um, that one's definitely more stressful than higher credit score, but it's still an option. You can always talk with more lenders. Banks are almost always going to be more strict than someone like a broker or a credit union is going to be. Um, <laughs> somebody asked, who are you? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure how to answer that question. I ask myself that every single morning. <laughs> Uh, Chris, Christopher, you said, is price per square foot a metric to use to compare homes or set our listing price? It can be used as both. Um, price per square foot is, is a pretty common metric to help determine, um, are you in the right ballpark, right? So it's not a foolproof method because you might have some features to your home that another house doesn't, that makes yours more attractive. Um, and it doesn't just come down to square footage. So it is something that can be really helpful, uh, usually to look at like what your square footage is in your local area, um, and then see if your home is kind of on track with that, um, should help you out a bit. Uh, Justin, you said current home is at uh, 4%. What I understand manufactured homes have higher interest rates as it is. Uh, use this low interest rate environment to purchase more real estate, rent the home we're in. Um, Cool. I think that's a good option. Uh, 4% still is a fantastic interest rate. Um, you know, when sometimes when rates get a little bit low, we can get a little greedy and forget that historically, like interest rates used to be like double digits. Like it was not uncommon to have a 12% interest rate. 4% still fantastic. People were making money on real estate when interest rates were 8%. So sometimes we can get a little short sighted and make rash decisions based off of. 1% ish, um, in, you know, in fluctuation. And it's really just not a huge issue. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a great plan that you have going on. Um, have you heard about there being a cap on seller contribution for investment properties? Uh, I was told a seller couldn't contribute more than 2% for the seller's help. help. That's correct. Uh, you cannot receive more than 2% of the purchase price towards closing costs when you're purchasing an investment property. Um, who knows why? <laughs> Tony, uh, if the appraisal comes lower than the sale price and the contract terminates because the seller won't decrease the price, me as the buyer will lose the money of the appraisal. Yes, you will lose the money of the appraisal. And the reason why is because it's the appraiser who got paid to do the job of the appraisal. It sucks that it came in low. Um, there's no way to get a refund. Uh, the appraisal, re the appraiser requires to be paid up front because they're supposed to be doing unbiased work. Uh, that's, um, you know, if they got paid when the deal closed, then you give an incentive to an appraiser to uh, appraise improperly because who wants to appraise a home if it's not going to go through, um, and you don't get paid. So yeah, it sucks. I'm really sorry about that. Um, there is no way to, to go back and, and get that money, unfortunately. Um, so it's a tough, it's a tough place to be. Uh, so I, I know how difficult that is. I've, I've had that happen quite a few times. Um, and it's, it's just, a, it's a hard thing to work through with buyers. Um, okay. I want to buy a home next year, but unfortunately I live in LA. I was thinking of buying an organ. What are some things to look out for when buying out of state and as a rental property? Um, buying out of state, especially as a rental property, is going to be difficult. I would really want to make sure that you're comfortable with the market that you're buying in and not just buying off of the hype of what you hear about that market. Um, until you get to know how that market is moving and how the values work and how uh, property condition affects the value, then it's going to be difficult to see if a rental property is going to be a good investment for you. So I'd first want to see either do you have like family and friends there who can help give you an idea? Um, because within a market, there might be specific neighborhoods that are that really stand out, but you wouldn't really know unless you were a local because there's more that goes into real estate than just uh, bare data and metrics. Um, a lot of it is the perceived value that's going to change future values. Um, you know, for instance, data isn't going to tell you how 
in over here in Dayton, Ohio, how you have lots of developing companies coming in and pushing out development through the rest of the city. You can see articles about this, but you don't get a good sense of if it's going to be a good investment until you're actually there for a little bit. So at least spend some time there, um, maybe interview some local businesses, local people as well to see uh, what neighborhoods might be beneficial for you. That might be hard to do, especially with COVID and social distancing <laughs> stuff. But um, that is personally uh, what I would do. Uh, Jen, you asked, are you familiar with Shinoa funds? I am not, unfortunately. Um, Jamie said, I'll ask a guy on the internet how much of a house I should buy. <laughs> yes. Uh, always good to do research on your own. My, my opinion, uh, should, I hope it matters a little bit. Um, but ultimately, you know, you're the one who's, who's doing the work. So, uh, it's difficult for me to say exactly how much you should purchase. Um, Genesis, you said Bank of, Bank of America loan does not alter rate and is not an FHA loan. The incentive is only to purchase homes in lower moderate income neighborhoods. Income restriction is 155 and price of 575. Um, so if that's the case, then that sounds like a good program. Again, uh, sh make sure you're talking with other lenders and seeing those options as well, um, just to see what's out there so that you know, uh, you know you've at least explored all those options um, just in case you need it. And my comments, man, they keep just flying all the way to the bottom, which is so frustrating. Um, oh, and you said it's also 3% down. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, Blue Mule Movers, you said love these Q&As. Well, thanks. I'm glad to do them. It's super awesome to see uh, the questions that you guys have. Something that I'm working on, and you're going to hear me referencing this uh, home buying planner that I'm working on. Um, because it's kind of a big project and uh, it's a little out of my skill set, but I'm slowly learning. Something that I'm working on building uh, is kind of an online home buying planner that's going to be this pre made task list for you to do. So, all your to do's that you need, it's going to help you pick the right loan option by you can plug in numbers and see which one, which loan option is the cheapest. But then, what I'm also doing is I'm taking the questions that come in through YouTube and the answers that I reply with them. And I'm building a whole database of question and answers. So what you'll be able to do is log in and search for something uh, and see if there's been any question and answer on that. And uh, it's going to save you from having to do all the Googling of all random questions. And you know, you get this massive blog post about something that you just wanted a two sentence answer for. And so hopefully that should be really helpful. Um, so I'm working on that, trying to catalog, you know, questions and answers, and it's going to take a little bit of time, but, uh, I think it's going to be well worth it. Um, well worth it in the end. Okay. Steve, you said, uh, loved one of your latest videos on new construction. Um, one can, one question, do you typically need the down payment? Um, in full, ready at the time of escrow for a loan approval. So you'll need the down payment at the time of closing. So when you're actually at the closing table, if it is new construction and the home is already built, um, you're there, you're going to sign and then gain occupancy. Uh, so you'll need the down payment then. You don't need it at the very beginning uh, when you initially sign the contract, just at the end when you're at the closing table. Uh, John, you asked, how does VA loan home loans view kit homes? Um, it's a great question that I've not encountered yet. Uh, I would need to double check myself on this, but from what I would imagine, a kit home should be viewed very similarly to a manufactured home because that's what it is. Um, as long as the home is, you know, meets code and the highest and best use of that home is residential, um, then you should be fine going VA. My only concern with a kit home is, are there going to be like appropriate uh, comparables in the area um, to help you set the price of that home? Because if the kit home is drastically different than the homes in the surrounding area, then it might be difficult for an appraiser to come up with a value um, that uh, the home is actually worth. And it seems like VA appraisals are being real sticklers recently. Um, I see more short VA appraisals than I do any other kind of loan. 
Um, and that's just kind of my personal uh, uh, view, or at least what I, my personal experience. Um, Jose, you asked, would $20,000 be enough as a down payment for a house of $320,000? Depends on the loan program that you're using, but um, the minimum that you could do is 3%, which would be $9,600. Uh, if you're doing a VA loan, it would be 0% down. If you're doing a USDA loan, um, it'd be 0% down. USDA loans are hard to get approved at that range because they have an income limit. Um, so normally I don't see USDA loans uh, above 250 most of the time. All right. Well, my glasses are all fogged up from <laughs> breathing into this cup. Uh, so my appraisal just came in and now the loan is currently with underwriting. How long uh, does it take to hear back from them uh, to full approval? My commitment date is on Friday uh, to provide to the seller. Um, so it really depends on the lender, but most of the time you're going to be seeing from an initial, an initial underwrite anywhere between two to seven days is, is, uh, is pretty common here. Um, I'm going to change up my screen here for just a second to make this a little bit easier for me to read. Uh, the Cruz family said, do you think home prices will go down soon? And how about interest rates? How long do you think they will stay down? I don't think home prices are going to... Um, I'm sorry, I don't think interest rates are going to go down much more. If interest rates continue to go down, um, then I feel like we might have a bigger economic problem going on. But just what we're seeing from like actual technical indicators, I don't see any uh, indicators that would make me believe interest rates are going to continue to keep going drastically down. Um, so what I can actually do is, um, here, let me show you my screen and show you how this works here. Um, okay, one second. And I just changed some stuff on, on my screen. So if you if it sounds different or something, let me know. Um, and I can address that here. But let me, let's see, share screen. Let's do, which one do I want to share? That one. Ooh. All right, give me one second here. Markets overview. Okay, so I'm going to add my screen up here. So you should be able to see this chart. And what this is, is this is uh, the US, our, this is the mortgage backed security, the 30 year. Okay. Um, so basically, the rates and prices have an inverse relationship. And this is going to get a little bit technical. So I hope this isn't, uh, this isn't too boring. But basically, when this chart goes up, this is the price. So when the price goes up, rates go down. All right, when the price goes down, rates go up. So we want to actually see this chart go up this way. Um, like we want it to head in that direction. So all of these lines across here are supports uh, and ceilings. So basically what this is showing us is there is a lot more resistance pushing down on the pricing um, going upwards, meaning that if they do break above these uh, ceilings, then there's not a ton of room until they reach the next ceiling, meaning that uh, if rates do decrease, then they're probably not going to decrease by much. It's going to take a lot more momentum to get rates down. However, on the inverse, if the price drops down below uh, this Fibonacci indicator right here, then we have a lot of room down, meaning a lot of room for interest rates to go up very, very quickly. And then we can see again with this next 
uh, phase of support and then this final one as well. There's a lot less support going on here than there is the ceiling, which makes me believe more that um, you know we're, we're more likely to see interest rates go up than we are go down. So um, hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of confusing uh, to 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 kind of read some of those charts a little bit, but um, home prices I do think they're going to go down here soon. Hopefully. <laughs> um, Again, I think we'll see a correction in the market. Um, okay, do you know if I can work with my own agent if I decided to work with Clayton Holmes? Uh, yeah, you can work with your own agent. I, I don't imagine they would have anything that says that you can't. Um, but just double check with them. Uh, is it okay to switch lenders while you're under contract? Yes, but I would question when you're doing it, like at what stage in the process. Um, because you want to make sure that you're still going to hit your contract date. Right, you don't want to delay the process all the way, and if you've already had an appraisal done, uh, you're going to need to get that appraisal transferred over to the new lender, and you need to make sure that those lenders are willing to do that. Not all lenders are willing to transfer in um, in appraisal. Um, Tina, you said, do you think it's best to purchase a modular home compared to a regular stick built home? Um, I think both have pros and cons, uh, modular homes tend to be more structurally sound than a stick built home, surprisingly, because they're pre-engineered um, and come, you know, get built or assembled at, at the, uh, actual, the actual plot of land. So uh, I think it comes down to personal preference. As far as resale value, you shouldn't see a huge difference between the two of them. Uh, Henry, are you a realtor? No, I am a loan officer. Um, is there fine print with home lenders if you buy a vehicle a month after buying a home as this would affect your DTI? So your DTI is only a snapshot of one point in time. So as soon as you close on a home, a lender is not going to look at your DTI anymore, like at all. If you wanted to, you could go close on a home and then take out however much debt you wanted to and be okay. Um, well, you probably wouldn't be okay financially, but nothing's going to happen with your loan. The lender only looks at your debt to income ratio as one point in time. And that's at the time of closing. All right, Mark, you said, uh, Hey Kyle, love your videos. Currently submitting an offer on a house for 475. Um, looks like it needs a fair amount of repair. Is there a repair limit you would suggest before walking away? It really depends on what you think the home is actually worth after repair value. Obviously, you don't want to put more money into uh, repairs before, um, like you don't want to put more money in repairs than the home is actually worth after repairs. So what I would do is, is maybe talk with a realtor if you're working with one and seeing what they would estimate the home would be worth after you make some of those repairs um, to make sure that you kind of create that limit for yourself um, and make sure you're upgrading essential things that match it with the rest of the market, uh, like your local neighborhood for that home. If it is a neighborhood, um, you know, so don't put extra amenities in it that the other surrounding homes that would be comparables don't have, because then you're going to spend a lot of extra money only for it to be downgraded by the surrounding properties. Jeb Smith, you said nice work. So Jeb Smith is, uh, another YouTuber. If you're interested, he has some really great videos on forbearance. Um, so I appreciate the comment, man. Uh, Jeb has a ton of great videos. He's been doing this way longer than I have. Um, so check out his stuff. Super good. All of his videos on like market and forbearance um, are great. I think they're way better than the ones that I would create if I made any, which I haven't done a lot on forbearance. Um, Cause I feel like Jeb's put out all the good content on it. <laughs> um, so I haven't. Um, I am planning to buy a second house soon and start investing in more houses. Uh, my plan is to rent them. Do I need to give 20% as a down payment for each house that I will be buying? If it's an investment property, the actual minimum down payment is 15%. Um, but yeah, if it's a single unit, you're going to be looking at 15 to 20% down for each property, uh, each investment property that you have. 
Now, um, if you are buying a second home and it's you know a, a good distance away from your current home, like maybe a hundred miles or more, then you could actually purchase as a second home and then do a down payment of ten percent, um, and then you can you can rent that out um, kind of like Airbnb style if you wanted to. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for, but it is an option. Um, any quick thoughts on the Denver market? Currently the hottest spot in the US since the pandemic. Um, I am not super familiar with the Denver market. I know everywhere out West is just ridiculously expensive. Um, I'm working on a video right now, just talking about affordability in general, the big problem that we're facing um, as a nation with home affordability that we've been seeing over the past few years, not just this past two year mark, but the past 15 plus years. Um, and everywhere on the West Coast tends to be the most out of reach affordability wise. So I'm not entirely sure how the pandemic has affected the market over there. Um, but I do know that whole West Coast market is uh, is just so, so crazy. Um, Y'all should come move out to the Midwest. <laughs> I'm in Ohio. You can buy a house here for 70000 if you want to. Um, and it's, it's not going to be the nicest house in the world, but it's a perfectly livable house. Um, and I guess that depends on your, your lifestyle. Um, but you could buy a really, you can buy a really nice house here, uh, for $250,000. Um, so come out to the Midwest. We don't have, uh, cool oceans or mountains. Maybe some of Midwest does. Maybe some mountains, but that's about it. Kyle, oh man, this is a good question. Uh, so you said, I feel like these historically low rates have only inflated prices. Um, so even if I can get approved for 3%, I'm essentially overpaying for the house. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly if it's like a one-to-one -one thing. Um, I think that would require like a really in-depth analysis to make that, um, that conclusion. But I think that general idea is very, like is, is, uh, very evident, right? Interest rates are low and it's pushing more buyers into the market because people can afford more when interest rates are lower and home buying becomes more attractive when interest rates are, interest rates are lower, um, which is creating less homes available, which is increasing the prices. And so you're right. Rates are lower, which means you can afford more, but home prices are now higher. So they kind of even themselves out a little bit. So, um, in essence, I think you're correct. Um, and it's just hard to say exactly how those numbers work out without doing kind of a, a more in-depth forecast that's um, way above my my knowledge. <laughs> um, what are appraisals looking like with such an inflated market? Uh, surprisingly, there's still a lot coming in solid, um, but slightly more homes are not appraising. Um, I don't know a specific percentage, but it's something that I'd be more cautious of, or at least be mindful of, uh, if you are having an appraisal coming up here soon. Um, if the market drops, how quickly would it drop? Uh, is it instantaneous or a slow trend? As far as housing prices, most likely it's going to be a slow trend. Um, in 2008, we did not see a slow trend. And that's because we actually had a crash. And the correction that we'll see is not a crash. I think that's really important to keep in mind. 2008 housing crisis, we had an actual crash because it was a really shaky foundation. It was like a home built on sand and then water came and pushed everything out and everything came, came crumbling down. It's because the whole housing market was propped up by bad loans. Right now, we have really solid, really well-performing loans. That's why mortgages are so frustrating to get sometimes. Is because of 2008. No one wants to relive that again. So the guidelines to get a mortgage are a lot more strict. So we're not going to see this crash. A lot of people are expecting that we're going to have another 2008 just because we're seeing a recession in the economy. Um, it's just not how it works. We're not in the same situation as 2008. We have a really strong foundation economically, um, or at least in the housing sector. 
So what we'll li most likely see with housing prices is it will be a gradual decline as uh, we see more listings come available on the market. Um, and most likely interest rates are going to go up a little bit when that happens. Uh, who do you recommend for VA home loans or lenders you might suggest not to use? Um, right now with VA, I think a really solid option is talking with a mortgage broker who uses UWM, that's United Wholesale Mortgage. Right now they have a program called Conquest and their VA pricing is fantastic. So I would look into, into that as an option. Um, anytime that I've seen a quote from uh, Veterans United, um, they've always been quite a bit higher in pricing than what we've offered. Um, trying to think who else is out there. Navy Federal. I don't know too much about Navy Federal's quotes. I feel like I'm missing a big one. Um, who am I missing? But with VA, still shop those around. A lot of veterans don't because, you know, a lot of these like VA home loan specific companies use a lot of like branding that makes it feel like they're kind of part of the government and they're not. Uh, they're just a generic, they're just a regular company like any other company. So almost all lenders can provide VA loans um, and VA loans are incredible. So I would definitely shop that around. Look, explore using a broker and seeing if they work with uh, United Wholesale Mortgage to get that, uh, that Conquest loan. Oh, now I can't see. <laughs> um, okay, so good question. You asked, uh, or you said, I have 30,000 saved. Um, no debt, credit score 675. My mom would like to co-sign with me for a VA loan. She's a retired veteran and my work history is mostly as a stay-at-home mom and working two months, can we get a VA loan? In this scenario, no. VA is very specific about who can be on a loan. It can only be a veteran and by themselves, so a veteran by themselves or a veteran and a spouse. It cannot be a veteran and non-veteran. So if your mom were to purchase the home, as a VA loan, she can do it by herself, but you can't be on the loan um, with her. Uh, what is the best loan program to use for an investment property? Uh, pros and cons of different loan programs for investment properties. So you can get a normal conventional loan um, for an investment property, um, which is just standard run of the mill conventional loan. Uh, for investment use, you're going to have a minimum of 15% down on a single family home. And interest rates on investment properties are almost always going to be higher. Just the nature of it, they're more risky. So um, something to be mindful of there. Now, when you're going through that process, you're going to have the normal underwriting process that you would for uh, any other purchase, right? They're going to look at your, your income and all that jazz, uh, which is super fun. Now, there are loans uh, called DSCR loans, which is a debt service coverage ratio loan. And this is really cool. So basically what it do, what they do is they don't look at your personal income at all. They give you a loan acting like the home is its own business. Okay. So you set up a LLC for that home. So you'd call it like one, two, three main street LLC. And then what they'll want to do is they'll want to see what the estimated mortgage payment is. So let's say it's a thousand dollars. And then there's a debt service coverage ratio um, and each lender is different, but let's say that ratio is 1.25. So that means as long as the lease, the rent that you'll receive is $1,250 per month and the mortgage payment is $1,000 per month, they'll give you the loan for it and never need to see any of your personal income. Okay. This is incredible for people who have a lot of properties and they don't want to go through the hassle of that or you're self-employed. Um, you know, you just change jobs. There's all these situations in which it's just frustrating to deal with the income underwriting process. So these DSCR loans are really interesting to look at. Um, now the down payments is going to be higher. You're probably going to look at minimum of 20% down and your interest rate is going to be higher than a normal conventional investment loan. Um, you'll probably be looking at 
Mm, close to 5% interest rate, um, but it's an investment property. Uh, you're going to be cash flowing that anyway, most likely. Um, so it shouldn't be a huge deal. You said uh, the lender said he was paying 12% a decade ago. Man, that is wild, 12%. Um, and what's crazy is affordability goes down so much. Like you can afford so much less of a house at 12% 12, uh, 12 interest rate than like a 3% interest rate. So it's just crazy to see this change happening along with the increase in home values um, is just ridiculous. Uh, Sydney, you said uh, you're about to take your broker exam here in California. Any last minute tips uh, would be appreciated. Cool. So um, what I would do is there's this lady on YouTube who I studied from and her name is, let me look it up. Uh, let's see. Affinity Real Estate and Mortgage Training. So she has a bunch of videos. I don't know her, but she has a bunch of videos um, on preparing for the NMLS test. And her stuff is so good. Like she'll give you these little things for how to remember uh, different things in the test. And like things that I still remember, like uh, like you have uh, TILA, like the Truth and Lending Act. Um, like she, So that's a Reg Z and you remember it because it's uh, TILA the Godzilla is what she would always say. So like that still sticks with me. And I took that test two-ish years ago. Um, two and a half? I can't remember. Um, so she's super good. Has a bunch of videos. I would highly recommend uh, watching those and, and getting some last minute tips from her. Mason, you said uh, you made it to a live video. Uh, hey, well, I'm glad you're here, man. Let me know if you have any questions or if you do, they might be a little bit lower here in the comments and I'll get to them. Um, you are refinancing. The lender misspelled your name on the eDoc signature but mentioned that he fixed it on the 1003 form. Should I continue with signing? Um, yeah, I don't think that that's an issue. So when you're signing, uh, you're only signing receipt of those documents. You're not signing any obligation to those terms. So obviously you want to make sure that when you sign at the closing table that your name is correct. Um, but all you're signing up until the point of getting to the closing table is just receipt saying, hey, I got these documents. So as long as that's going to be fixed moving forward, then I don't think that that's an issue at all. Sean, you asked, is it possible to get a 0% interest rate? Currently have a 3.5% and about to refinance to a 2.49 using my VA credit score is 698. Uh, I, there's no lender offering a 0% interest rate. The lowest that I've seen right now is a 1.99 and that requires a hefty amount of fees up front to get that. Um, so no one's offering a 0% interest rate right now. If if uh, people were offering a 0% interest rate, I would have way bigger concerns. Um, there are other countries that, what country was it? There's one country in Europe that's offering negative interest rates where they're actually paying off the balance of the mortgage for you. Um, and I'll just kind of explain briefly what's happening there. So when you have interest rates that are zero or negative, then that means the economy is in really not great shape. That means that investors are actually willing to lose money be in mortgages because they think they'll lose more money in another investment. They're trying to safeguard their money, right? Instead of putting it into like stocks where they think they might, uh, you know, have a decrease in value of, I'm going to make this up, 10%, they'd be more willing to put it into a mortgage where they're willing, where they're losing 2%. So, if we see interest rates flip to zero or negative, we have a big issue because that means that um, investor sentiment is really poor in the market as a whole and that uh, everybody's anticipating losing money and they're trying to find the place to make their money lose as least 
amount as possible, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I hope we don't get 0% interest rates because that means we have a huge problem. Um, you might save money on your mortgage, but you're going to lose a lot of money elsewhere because the economy is going to be rough. Uh, Jen, you asked, why did they send out the CD when you're still in underwriting? Scheduled to close 1030, but no commitment letter from underwriting. Um, so the you get a preliminary CD um, and every lender sends it out at different stages. So like some lenders will send it out. They want you to have title, insurance and appraisal back um in in the loan before they'll send out the cd some only require insurance some only require a title it just depends lender to lender but you'll get a preliminary cd and the reason why they want to send out the cd early is because it starts the the three-day timer um so there's a law that requires uh it was a law that's called trid um and it requires that lenders send out a closing disclosure three days before closing so the earlier they can send it out the sooner you can close because you know the last thing normally that people want is you're ready to close then you send out a cd now you have to wait three business days um people get really mad <laughs> when that happens so that's why they send out the cd in the beginning it's most likely a prelim uh cd it's very good it's gonna be close to your loan estimate uh because it's still loan estimate because it's still an estimate most likely um and as far as your commitment letter you're probably talking about like your initial approval. I would imagine if you already have the CD, then you you have to have an initial approval to get a CD. So you should have an initial commitment lender or a commitment letter from underwriting. Not every lender necessarily is like going to give you a commitment letter um, in that in that sense, or if it it might be buried in a package uh, that you sign. So maybe talk to your lender and see um, you know where where they're at with underwriting because you most likely have an initial approval. They're just waiting to clear a couple last minute items. Um, nobody, thanks for the tip. Appreciate it. Uh, can we qualify for FHA loan? Don't have credit. We don't use a credit card. Sixty thousand dollars saved uh, up. Looking to buy a house from one eighty to two hundred thousand. Thirty six thousand income, no debt. Cool. So I have a video um, about getting a loan with no credit score. And what I'm going to do is I am going to link that in here for you. Maybe if I can find it. There we go. Okay, so I just posted this uh, link in the comments for you. So this is um, how to get a loan with no credit score. Um, when is closing for a new build when it's finally finished being built? Yes, when it is finally finished being built, because what's going to have to happen um, is an appraiser is going to have to inspect the home and assess that it, the value actually matches what you're you're purchasing it for. Um, and you'll want a final inspection done to make sure, you know, construction is was all smooth and such. Um, all right. Hey, Kyle, you, it seems in our area, Tampa, Florida, that new construction is not selling as fast as pre-existing homes. Any insight as to why? Um, P.S. My husband and I love your channel. Well, thanks. I, I like that you enjoy the channel and I'm super glad that you've you've commented here and joined us. Um, why new construction is not selling as fast as pre-existing homes uh, may be because of the price compared to uh, the perceived value of the home. Right now, Construction is expensive uh, because of the whole pandemic junk and everything that's been going on there. Um, the cost of materials is ridiculously high. Uh, you know, I don't stay up to date on lumber prices, <laughs> but a friend of mine told me um, he was looking at building a deck and building it was going to be uh, double the cost now than it was a, uh, last year. Um, because of how much prices have increased. So I don't know if it's actually double. Again, I don't I don't do anything with lumber. So <laughs> I couldn't tell you the ins and outs of lumber prices, but I do know that materials to build homes are more costly. So because of that, new construction would be more expensive to cover those costs. And you know, in your specific market, it may be that a pre-existing home 
offers more for the same price that a new construction home does. Mason, you said, uh, I signed my contract with a new home builder. Three weeks later, they decreased the price by $9,000. Is there any way to get your original price down to what they changed it to? Um, so did they decrease it to 9,000 and then they increased it back up? You said, is there a way to get my original price down to what they changed it to? Oh, I think I understand what you're saying. You sign the contract and then three weeks later, that model price probably decreased by $9,000. Is there any way to get that original price down to what they changed it to? Ooh, that's going to be difficult. Um, and the reason why is because the contract is signed. So there's not a ton of room for negotiation at this point. Um, if you're working with a realtor, then it might be worth talking to them and seeing if there's options. Um, somewhere in your contract that they can find that would be helpful there. I feel like it's going to be difficult since the contract is signed. Um, it does suck that it's gone down and they haven't been able to, you know, to keep up with that. I would at least ask. It's worth <laughs> it's worth seeing. Uh, there's no harm in asking or maybe getting a realtor involved to see if they have any solutions there for you. Aubrey, you asked, are renovation loans a thing for houses that need some work? With amazing houses flying off the market, it sounds like it could maybe be a good idea. Renovation loans are a thing. So you have things like 203K loans. You have Fannie Mae Homestyle. Um, renovation loans basically are going to finance uh, the purchase of the home along with the rehab cost. Um, so they are a thing. They're a pain to work with, uh, frankly, um, just because... You know, lenders want to get their hands in the whole process. So they absolutely are a thing um, and can be used correctly. The best solution for renovation really is if you have a primary residence right now and you pull out something like home equity line of credit, that's going to be your easiest solution for renovations because you get full control, full say over your what you're doing with re uh, rehab cost. When you do a renovation loan, the lender wants to see everything that you're doing. They want to see it done by a contractor. Um, they want to do inspections periodically. It just becomes this big mess of, you know, somebody wanting to get their hands in it the entire time. Um, everyone in LA is offering $50,000 above asking. Good Lord. Uh, is this normal? They even list it lower than what the seller expects. Uh, yeah. The LA market, something else. Um, Fifty thousand dollars is wild because the average, the median home price in this city where I live is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> so if someone's offering up fifty thousand above asking, um, then there's no way that house is going to appraise. But in LA, your home values are way higher than what they are here in Dayton, Ohio. Um, so is it normal? It's becoming normal. Uh, the question is, what's normal? Um, this market is ridiculous. We're in a super high sellers market. I, if I knew a home was, uh, you know, I was overpaying for it by $50,000. Um, then I would, I wouldn't overpay that much. I would just kind of, uh, be patient and wait it out. Um, but it's super frustrating. Uh, can you explain underwriting and what exactly the lender is doing during that time? So during underwriting, uh, the lender is basically verifying all the information that you sent in on your loan application. So you sent in a loan application that was basically answering questions about your, your income and how much money you have in the bank account and where you lived and all that. Um, and then they take that information along with your credit report and they uh, send it into a software uh, that's called AUS. It's an automated underwriting software or automated underwriting system. And that software is going to run through thousands of pages of mortgage guidelines and basically say, hey, you're approved for a loan or you're not approved. Now, if you've made it to a pre-approval stage, you got pre-approved, then the software said, you're in. Uh, and then what happens is you get under contract and an underwriter is going to look at the report that the underwriting software creates. And then they want to match your real life documents to that report. So if on the software, 
it was ran and it says you make fifty thousand dollars a year and you got an approval they want to see you know pay stubs w-2s that support fifty thousand dollars a year in income if you actually make forty five thousand dollars a year then they're going to rerun it through the software to make sure that you're still approved um, through the mortgage guidelines so in essence the underwriting process is a lot of verifying of information packaging everything together in one big bundle so at the very end, they have this whole thing packaged and ready to go. Um, and at some point, I should probably get on here and we should, uh, maybe you guys can help me out on my Hinge profile. <laughs> See if we can uh, increase some of the, uh, some of what's going on in my dating life. See how that goes. <clears throat> I said that because I just got a, <coughs> excuse me, notification here. Uh, Charles, you asked, can you explain down payment assistance programs and what benefits do they have? You live in LA and have enough for a down payment, but rather keep as much of the bank as possible. Down payment, down payment assistance programs are all different. Some, you know, they, they treat repayment or non-repayment in different ways and sometimes can have some red tape to them. Um, usually down payment assistance programs have a higher interest rate and can sometimes have some more restrictions than a regular loan. So what I would always do is look at the down payment assistance option and compare it with a regular loan to see what's going to be a better option uh, for you. Because even though you might save some money up front, it might be more costly down the road. <laughs> Johnny said nothing like a good old bond. Can uh, convexity is it convexity crash course? Uh, yeah, I, um, it was super cool to learn how bonds work in their pricing in relation to rates. Um, some of that stuff is kind of fascinating to me, but it's also boring for most people. Um, so. Uh, Henry, I make $40,000 a year in New York city. Um, Ooh, man, that's a tough city to live in. Cost wise, most houses where I live start at $400,000. Is it worth saving a long time to afford an investment property or should I invest in a lower cost area somewhere else? Personally, I would invest in a lower cost area somewhere else. New, New York is going to be like, you're going to be saving for a long, long, long time to uh, get an investment property in New York. So personally, I would look at a low cost area. Um, there's just because you live in a high cost area doesn't mean one, that you have to stay there and two, uh, that you have to purchase or invest there as well. So personally, I would look somewhere else, um, but it's just my personal opinion. Um, and also New York City real estate is a beast on its own. Um, so I'd be very careful investing in there, making sure that you have maybe some investment experience before going into um, a, an investing environment as uh, cutthroat as New York City can be. Um, are there special schooling or skills required to be a lender? So like to be a loan officer, for instance, uh, what you have to do is there, there's no degree requirement. Um, you have to pass a 24 hour, uh, I'm sorry, a 20 hour national licensing uh, course. And then normally you have a state requirement on top of that. So for instance, in Ohio, uh, the, the national course is 20 hours and then the state licensing is four. And basically what you're doing is you're going over a lot of laws, um, a lot of like, hey, this is what money laundering is. Don't launder money. Hey, this is what fraud is. Don't commit fraud. <laughs> so what a lot of that course is. And then you take the test and that's it. That's all of the like actual schooling requirements to become a loan officer. Um, now, actually learning how to put together a loan and qualify people is something that a company would need to teach you. Learning that on your own would be wildly difficult. Um, I don't even know where you would begin because there's not a ton of like loan officer training courses um, on actually like structuring loans and understanding how everything works together. Um, as far as skill set, I think that... Uh, it, there's a lot of different jobs in the lending world. So for instance, you could be a loan officer 
Um, and a loan officer is mainly going to be uh, talking with people and helping match them with loan programs and working them through getting qualified. Um, so for instance, that's what I do. And you know, loan, a loan officer is traditionally like a salesperson. Um, so, you know, that might be conducive to a more particular personality style. I'm not a very salesy person, um, but I'm in technically a sales position. So what I've found with sales is that if you just help people and you be honest, um, then normally you're going to do pretty well. Uh, you don't have to be all like sleazy and car salesman -y to people. Um, although there are a lot of loan officers who are like that. Um, so you could be a loan officer. You could be an underwriter. Underwriters uh, never talk to borrowers. They only talk to like the loan officers. Um, so an underwriter is going to be more like uh, data, paperwork, uh, analysis. Um, and there's tons of other jobs. You could be like a closer. You could be a processor and work on documents. You could do um, what else? What are some of the other big ones? Uh, those are kind of the, the big ones, but there's really not a lot of schooling, but it, it's one of those things that there's an easy entry point, but it can take a little bit of time to kind of figure out what you're doing. Because like, I got licensed as loan officer, passed my test, uh, you know, did all the studying, and then come time to do my first loan. I have no idea <laughs> how to do a loan. Or like, you have an idea of how you understand kind of what a loan is, like you're paying back money that you were given, but you don't understand like how it actually works in the whole grand scheme of things. Like, where is this money coming from? Who is it going to? Who is it actually being paid back to? How is this whole system working together? Um, that takes a lot more uh, hands-on experience to, to kind of assemble and put together. Um, Alex. With a lot of new job transitions, changes, and some losing jobs during COVID, is there amount of time required having a full-time income again before applying for a loan? Um, so the guidelines say if you've been out of work for six months, um, then you'll need to explain why you were out of work. Now with COVID, it's a perfectly reasonable explanation to say, hey, I was out of work for COVID. So getting back on the job um, for most lenders is you're going to need at least one pay stub that shows two weeks uh, worth of pay. Um, some lenders re might require more of a month. Uh, so you'd have two pay stubs there, but I wouldn't expect any more than a month being back at the job, um, especially if the reason why you were unemployed um, or furloughed or had a job transition is because of COVID. Um, and with a job transition, if it's a new job, the one thing that you want to be careful of is that there isn't a probationary period with that employer specifically. Um, so if it is a new job, the lender is going to want to see the offer letter that you were given. So if there was like, if it says, you know, you have a 90 day probationary period, um, then you'll have to wait that period before you can get a loan. Um, is it remotely possible to have a home that could be used for sub vocalization? Um, what is sub vocalization? Am I missing something? Vocalization. Let me see here. Sub vocalization, the act or process of inaudibly articulating speech with the speech organs. Can you clarify? I'm not. 100% on understanding uh, what the question is. Uh, how long do you think interest rates are hold for? Great question. No clue. I think any level of certainty that anybody has about interest rates is completely out of the window with how tumultuous, tumultuous? Is that how you say that? Uh, how crazy this market is with our political environment as well. Um, so things are just so rocky that it's hard to say what's going to happen. Even if we're looking at like historical data, it's difficult to predict what's going to happen. I think November is going to cause a change in the market either way. Um, 
and specifically how that will happen depending on who becomes elected um, i think is impossible to say as well because it's so difficult to see how the market's going to react um, because the market is almost entirely based on fear <laughs> right a market is all based on like investor sentiment towards the economy not necessarily the underlying value of the economy if that makes sense so how long i don't know personally i would lock my loan as early as i could um, there's more room for rates to increase than there is for them to decrease um, that's just my my personal opinion there conventional versus va loan um, in my opinion va loans are almost always better than a conventional the one thing you're going to have to watch out for is the funding fee so if this is a, a new um, I'm sorry, this is your first VA loan. You're going to be looking at a funding fee of 2.3%, uh, unless you're 10% disabled or more. Um, so if you're 10% service disabled or more, they waive the funding fee. Uh, but 2.3% can be a hefty fee added in there on that VA loan. If it's a subsequent purchase, meaning you've already used a VA loan before, um, then I believe the subsequent purchase is 3.6% funding fee. Uh, double check me on that. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, and it's like 9.30 at night, so... Um, a little foggy. Can't remember. It's 3.3 or 3.6. Um, Austin, Texas, inflated home prices. Would you say Airbnb would be a better route opposed to lease tenants? How do you feel about Airbnb? Um, personally, I like Airbnb. I like using them. Uh, like I like going to a city and using Airbnb. I've always had a good experience and I love like last time I did an Airbnb, I was in Michigan. Um, and everyone that I've, every host that I've encountered is like super chill. Like I, I think I came in there at like nine at night and then we drank a couple beers, ate chips and salsa and talked about who knows what. Uh, and then he like made breakfast for me in the morning. I was like, for like <laughs> like 50 bucks a night or something um it's ridiculous uh so i like it as a user um but as far as the investing side not too for not too familiar with airbnb um i don't think that i could give you uh, good advice there unfortunately Um, if someone had an FHA loan with, uh, PMI, and this is a small correction, but FHA actually calls it MIP mortgage insurance premium. So exact same thing as PMI. Um, but they just call it mortgage insurance premium instead of private mortgage insurance. It's dumb semantics. Uh, but if the housing market did crash, could the owner get out of that house without paying, uh, the negative equity since they had PMI or would the mortgage company sue them? So mortgage insurance only protects the lender it will never be beneficial to um, a buyer so it's frustrating it'd be nice if you could use it in that way but it just doesn't work that way mortgage insurance is only in the event that um, a buyer doesn't pay on a mortgage anymore um, it never does anything to help the buyer it's only there for uh, for the lender Oh, wait, did I skip someone's question accidentally? If I skip your question, it's not on purpose. Don't take it personally. Okay, uh, my new construction won't tell me exactly when we're closing. Um, I wanna stop around, oh, shop around before and make a decision to use a preferred lender. Um, I know complete date will be in January. Oh yeah, if, if completion date's in January, shoot, yeah, I'd shop that thing around. Um, you have plenty of time. Uh, preferred lender is probably going to give you more credits, um, but absolutely might be worth uh, or absolutely is worth looking at seeing what other lenders are op offering um, and seeing if you can get, you know, a better rate or better credits. Um, quick question. I am currently renting. Does my first property purchased 
with either FHA or conventional have to be a primary residence or can it be a rental? So FHA can never be a rental. FHA has to be a primary residence. Um, you can purchase a investment property as your first, uh, first property while you're still renting. Just expect a lender to be very, uh, to look at you a lot more closely um, since you don't have a primary residence of your own. Uh, so just expect that. But if it's an FHA loan, the only time when you can do like an investment of sorts, and it's technically not an investment, is if you do like a two to four unit building and you live in one of the units, um, it's still a primary residence, but you can rent out those other units. Um, all right, let me clear out some spam comments here. Uh, what's the max DTI debt to income ratio for FHA versus the max debt to income ratio for conventional and which one is better? Max debt to income ratio for an FHA loan back end ratio is 56.99%. Front end ratio is 367 36.99%. Conventional loans have a back end debt to income ratio of 49.99% and no front end ratio. Um, so which one is better? It depends on your situation. Higher credit scores normally are going to benefit from conventional, uh, medium to low credit scores. So anywhere 680 and below is normally going to benefit from an FHA loan. Um, can you please explain the process where the buyer borrows money from a hard money lender, buys the house and then stabilizes it and then refinances the house. So most likely what you're talking about is maybe there's a home in not great condition, uh, where a lender would not give a loan for it. They're purchasing the home with a hard money loan. Hard money loans normally require a lot more money down and have really high interest rates, like closer to eight to 9%. And are normally for a short period of time, they usually have some sort of balloon on them, meaning it might be due in six to 12 months. The entire note is going to be called due um, in that in that time frame. So in that situation, what someone is doing is they're purchasing a distressed home. They're fixing it up to the standards where they can now purchase it with something like a conventional loan. I'm sorry, not purchase it, refinance it into a conventional loan, get a lower interest rate. Um, but those property requirements now meet conventional standards um, where they didn't beforehand and they don't have to worry about a traditional rehab alone. Um, so I'm guessing that's what you're talking about. I'm not super familiar with them, um, but that's kind of the general the general process of how that works. Um, someone is in the office and I think just turned the alarm on. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me turn off the alarm here on my phone before um, the alarm goes off on me. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, hold on one second here. The last thing I need is the police to show up right outside my window while I'm doing this. <laughs> Okay, got that squared away. Um, okay, hey Kyle, my sister and I wanted to buy a duplex in March. Uh, we'll be buying as tenants in common. Would it be easier to get approved conventional or FHA? FHA is gonna be easier. You're also gonna be doing a, a lower down payment going FHA, you can do 3.5%. Um, and on uh, conventional, You'll most likely need to be putting 15% down um, as a duplex. And let me check myself on that. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, two unit is 15%.
Um, once the house is owned by the buyer, is it easy to refi? Yeah, refinance is is pretty easy. Um, the nice thing is you're not running into like, you know, the drama of working with a seller and the listing agent and all that junk. So um, once you own the home, a refinance is pretty easy, especially if you qualified for the purchase, you probably qualify for the refinance as well. Um, when in the home buying process, does the lawyer do the paperwork and what should I be aware of? Um, if you don't have a realtor, you might have an attorney doing uh, some of the paperwork. Um, what to be aware of? Uh, kind of a broad question. Um, just mainly make sure that you understand all the components of the contract. Um, and with a real estate contract, you mainly want to look for uh, what we call outs. So what are ways that you can get out of the contract and not lose your shirt in the process? Um, because you can't just like leave a contract whenever you want to. It's a contract. You're bound to the terms in that legally. So make sure that you understand if something happens, what are ways that you can get out of that contract? Um, okay, so Ali, you said, so if you buy with an LLC and get a hard money under an LLC, then refinance will also have to be under an LLC, which is not always easy. So most lenders are not going to allow you to close a primary residential loan in an LLC. They may let you close an investment loan in an LLC. It just depends how you're planning on using the, the property. Um, you might have to, if you purchase it in an LLC and the lender is not going to let you close in an LLC when you do the refinance loan, then you might have to do a quick claim to flip it from the LLC to your personal title. Um, and if that's the case, normally you'll have to be on the title for about six months before you can refinance. So the whole LLC stuff adds an extra layer of complexity, but you'll need to check with the lender to see if they'll allow you to close inside of an LLC. It can be really difficult um, to find a lender who will let you do that on a, uh, like a, a normal residential loan. You'll normally need like a commercial loan to close in an LLC easily. Uh, Brittany, you said there's a lumber shortage. Lumber during COVID slowdown, lumber supply deteriorated, prices spiked, and demand didn't fall nearly as much. Yeah, lumber prices are high. Man, am I this far behind in the comments? Ooh. Okay, maybe I need to make my question shorter <laughs> or my answer shorter. Uh, I got conditional approval for new build. The house will not be ready until March. Can I try to get a lender next year? Um, or do I have to stick with the lender that gave? them the commitment letter. Um, nope, you can do new lender, no problem at all. Uh, short term imbalance that should be corrected and or rectified in due time. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, with those uh, lumber prices, and I think just material costs in general, hopefully we'll see that correct here, uh, here soon. Um, Carolyn, do I need to notify the lender of our FHA loan if we're buying a second house that will become our primary residence? Um, we've lived in the house for five years and we'll keep it as a vacation home. Uh, you don't need to notify the lender. They'll know about it anyway when they pull a credit report. It's going to show that you have a loan with FHA in there um, and they'll be able to handle that and it really shouldn't be an issue at all. Um, should I pick a lender first or a real estate agent? Personally, I think you should talk to a lender first. See if you qualify and how much you qualify for, then you can talk with a real estate agent. There's not much you can do with a real estate agent unless you know um, how, uh, like how much you actually qualify for and if you qualify. So that's where I'd first start. Um, you said your glasses are awesome. Thanks. Uh, where did you get them from? Please. Uh, I got them from a company called Garrett Light, which is the son of the guy who makes Oliver Peoples glasses. I think Oliver Peoples is a company. I don't know, it's Garrett Light. How do you spell that? Garrett Light. G-A-R-R-E-T-T-L-E-I-G-H-T. -T -T -E -E <laughs> so he said, let's get Kyle some dates. Yeah, read us the hinge questions and we'll help. Um, Maybe I think one one day, if I uh, 
maybe I'll have to open a bottle of wine and we'll sit here and run through that profile together and see what we can come up with. <laughs> that would be an interesting time and definitely a departure from uh, from some of the home buying stuff. Uh, just start an investment business and want to start with fix and flip to start portfolio. Is Detroit, Michigan a good start? I don't know. I'm not familiar with the Detroit, Michigan area, um, but I would talk with a local real estate agent and see if they can help you navigate that market. Um, and then what's the after repair value of some of those properties would be. I think it's going to be your best route is to find somebody who's uh, who lives there, who understands that market um, in and out. Um, Norma, you said I used the USDA loan tool on their website and it said I'm eligible for the USDA guaranteed program. What should I do next? Next is you want to talk to a lender and let them know you're looking to apply with a USDA loan. So you can talk with a credit union, a broker, a direct lender, a bank. Um, they're all going to have access to USDA guarantees program. And so you'll want to get pre-qualified through a lender to go with a USDA loan. Um, how long do you need to be in a home before you can do a home equity line of credit? Um, so personally, like our company doesn't do uh, HELOCs, so I can't speak directly to them. Um, I don't have experience doing them, but from my understanding, I don't believe there's a time limit that you need to be on the, the property to get a home equity line. Um, let's see. Well, I stand corrected. Maybe there is. It looks like it may be closer to six to 12 months. Okay, yeah, this says most HELOC lenders don't have a specific amount of time. You must wait, um, but some have a stipulation of six months to a year. Uh, so I would check with some local lenders and see um, they can probably give you a better answer than I can. Um, is it possible to buy a home off your phone without a real estate agent? Are there any cost benefits to do this? Yeah, so you can purchase a home without a real estate agent. Um, even you, know, you don't have to, to use uh, your phone necessarily, but you can use some of those sites and purchase a home without a real estate agent. Um, and negotiate some cost savings with uh, with the seller because they won't have to pay for a realtor. Um, now, you are going without representation from a realtor, uh, which I think is worth it, but you do have to understand, I, I think it's always valuable to understand like the bias that people have. Um, so for instance, like I'm third generation in real estate. My grandpa is a real estate agent. My dad's a real estate agent. I'm a loan officer. My brother's a real estate agent. Like. Uh, you know, so I'm in that world a little bit. I don't want to sit here and say that you have to use a real estate agent because that's not fair um, to say that. You can absolutely do it without. Just make sure that you really understand what you're doing um, and you're really watching out and protecting yourself through that process because it can be easy to to slip up um, and misnavigate things and uh, and cause some some damage to yourself financially. Uh, you said my lender just notified that the DPA would be zero down payment assistance would be zero interest, zero payment forgivable. Second lien, what's the catch? Um, it's possible that it's like a community grant program. Um, sometimes there isn't a catch. Some down payment assistance programs uh, are just grant funds given out by uh, community housing programs. Um, it's definitely worth you know reading over the documents that they give you about the DPA um, just to make sure that there's nothing in there. No no stipulations that might not sit well with you. Um, so you said first time boat, <laughs> first time home buyer, the house is $200,000 and I have 20% down with a credit score of 750. Do I have to pay PMI with an FHA loan? So first of all, FHA loans, uh, are going to require mortgage insurance, what they call mortgage insurance premium. So it's MIP um, for the duration of the loan, unless you put 10% down. If you put 10% down, then you have mortgage insurance for 11 years. Now, 
in your situation, I would recommend a conventional loan because you're putting 20% down and you have a high credit score. And if you go with a conventional, you won't have to pay any mortgage insurance at all. So I think it's going to be way more advantageous for you to go the conventional route um, because with the FHA loan, even if you put 20% down, you still are going to have mortgage insurance for 11 years and you have to pay the upfront mortgage insurance of 1.75%, which on a $200,000 loan is $3,500 that's going to be tacked onto your loan. So you're going to have to take out a loan for $203,500, uh, you know, instead of 200. So I'd go conventional. I think it's going to be your better option. How to get approved for a loan with only one year of tax return? What's the fastest way for you to get approved for a loan if you're in the process of changing a career and what is the timeline like? So first of all, how to get approved for a loan with only one year of tax return? Um, are you self-employed? Uh, like, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you're referencing. So with a conventional loan, you have to be self-employed for five years. Uh, and then what will happen is the underwriting software, if you have a high credit score, might come back and say they only need to see one year of tax returns. Um, now that's not always the case. So if you're going one year of tax returns, keep in mind, they'll also normally want to see a, a year to date profit and loss statement. So they're actually looking at more than one year of income. They're looking at one full calendar year of income plus a year to date profit and loss. Um, so just keep that in mind because they're going to look at that for qualifying income. Um, what's the fastest way to get approved for a loan if you're in the process of changing a career. So if you're entirely changing the field that you're in, um, then you're gonna wanna be in that job. Uh, there's not necessarily a timeline required for it, but most lenders are gonna wanna see you in that a new line of work for three to six months, um, unless you have some sort of like certification that you can back that up with, then you might be able to get away with doing uh, a month on the job. Um, and make sure that you don't have any um, probationary period in your new employment. Uh, sometimes new employment requires like a 90 day probationary period. Um, so you have to wait out that probationary period before you can get approved. Um, uh, so you said you're very informative and so clear and easy to understand on the topics of home ownership and related topics. I'm really glad I found your channel. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, and thanks for commenting and, and watching these videos. Uh, Norma, you ask, can you still qualify for a home loan with high student loans? You can. It just depends on your debt to income ratio. Um, so lender is going to have to use 1% of the outstanding balance as your monthly payment. So if you have uh, $20,000 in student loans, then you will have a a monthly payment of $200 <laughs> with like a little mini stroke there. Um, so you can, it really just depends on your, your income situation and your total debt situation. Donald, no sleeping, no sleeping. Got to wake up, man. Okay, I will be applying for a VA loan to purchase a home in Florida since it takes time to move from the left coast to the right coast. Uh, interesting. I've never heard of somebody, let's say, I'm not, <laughs> normally you're west coast to east coast. Um, is there a mandatory time limit to occupy the house after closing? VA loans on their occupancy requirement normally require 90 days. Um, now, a spouse can occupy earlier than that, and they'll count that. Um, but normally 90 days, there's not necessarily somebody who's like, they're not going to come visit you at day 90 to see are you there. Um, but, you know, make a good reasonable effort. Uh, I imagine it won't take you longer than three months uh, to be able to move in. Ooh, good question. So can you shed some light on the 0.5% um, fee which Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac decided to charge borrowers in order to refinance? And is this an upfront cost or does the new interest rate increase by 0.5%? Um, excellent question. 
So, yeah. <laughs> Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they did charge this. Uh, what's effectively, you know, people in the industry are calling a tax. It's not a tax necessarily, but we're all kind of viewing it that way. Um, for some reason, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac want to make more money on refinances. So uh, they're charging uh, half a percentage point. Now, how does this actually work? And this is it's confusing um, to understand. So it's not an upfront cost uh, and it's not an interest rate change. It is instead a points cost of the loan. Okay, so what it would actually be more similar to is um, like, let's say we had a $200,000 loan, uh, 0.5% is going to be $1,000. Okay, so in that sense, it kind of is like an upfront cost, but what most lenders are going to do is they're not going to put the $1,000 in on points they're going to bring you back up to a par rate. So if you did qualify for a rate of, let's say, 3%, at that new 0.5% fee to decrease the points cost of $1,000, they might bring you up to like a 1.25%. I'm sorry, a 3.25%. So your interest rate difference isn't going to exactly correlate to the fee cost. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So you could view it kind of like an upfront cost, but most lenders are going to take you back to a par rate so that you aren't paying that cost upfront. Um, and let me know if I need to clarify that. It can be kind of confusing to see how those, those work together. Unfortunately, the mortgage world is way more complex than it needs to be, but here we are. Um, Ricky, you said I'm pre-approved for 250,000, uh, with about $1,000 monthly debt, $50,000 yearly income, um, VA home loan, uh, 2.35%, no funding fee conflicted to wait and get debt lowered to 350 or buying something ASAP in LA County. Yeah. So your income is $50,000 a year. Um, let me see this. 50,000, so you're, you're bringing a monthly salary of 40, about 4,200. Now, if we take, uh, let's say we have 75% left over after taxes and whatever other deductions. So your take home pay is probably closer to maybe $3,100, I'm imagining. Um, so having $1,000 a month in debt and then on top of that, having a housing payment, um, to me, seems very high. I, that would be uncomfortable for me because if you're taking away the debt payments, then you have $2,100 left over. Um, and you know a lot of that's going to be taken over by a housing payment. So personally, I would want to get a lot of that debt taken care of. I think you're going to feel um, a lot better when, when that debt's gone. And then you're going to have a lot more joy coming from purchasing a home then if you purchase one now, and it's going to be so much harder to pay off your debt um, if you have that uh, the higher housing cost. Uh, Michael, you asked, does something like gap insurance exist for mortgages? I am not familiar with gap insurance for mortgages, um, but definitely something that I should look into. Um, how far back do lenders want to see your W-2s, check stubs, and bank statements? And what ratio that lenders consider for your DTI front or back? Uh, so how far back do lenders see your W-2s? Uh, normally a max of two years. Um, sometimes it's only one year. So, um, you know, we're in we're in the end of 2020. So they'll want to see 2018 and 2019. Um, once we flip over to February of uh, next year, they'll want to see 2019 and 2020. Um, Check stubs, normally they want to see past 30 days and bank statements past two months. Uh, what's the ratio that lenders more consider for your DTI? Um, they consider them both equally. Uh, normally, 
most of the time, as long as you're within the back end housing ratio, most people don't have a problem with the front end. Um, and it depends on the loan type, like conventional loans don't have a front end housing ratio. Um, FHA loans have like a, a back end of 56.99 and a front end of 36.99. Um, so it really just depends. Um, there's not like one that takes precedence over, over the other. Uh, Alex, you said all of your information is super helpful or always really helpful. And thanks for being a great resource. You are welcome. And thanks for, for commenting and watching. Um, I appreciate it. And Alex, thank you for your comment as well. I appreciate it. Oh no, it shot all my videos or all my all my comments down again. Oh, good lord. Uh, do you know if DACA recipients will qualify for any mortgage loans? Um, you know, I'm not super familiar currently. I know there's been some issues with DACA recently. So I've never done a DACA loan. Um, and frankly, I just haven't encountered anybody working with, uh, you know, who's a, a DACA recipient, um, who's looking to qualify for a loan. So I feel like I can't speak to them right now. I just don't have experience with them. Um, but something that I would need to do a little bit more research on. Um, is it possible to pay the <laughs> to get an FHA loan while you owe the IRS and make payments under an installment agreement? Yes, absolutely. Um, you'll normally need to make three consecutive on-time payments before uh, an underwriter will approve you on an FHA loan. Um, Thomas, you said, just want to say great videos, very informative. Wish you in Florida. I can use you as my LO. So uh, first of all, thanks. Um, I actually am licensed in Florida. Um, I am actually stepping out of originating personally, but uh, our team here in our office is licensed in Ohio, Tennessee, and Florida. So you're welcome to shoot me an email um, and I can get you connected with uh, Tammy, who's our office manager. She's in the office right over there. Well, not right now, but uh, she works in the office right over there. Uh, Jason, you asked... Uh, Quick question, if my wife gets a new job in the same field as the previous job, how does this impact our ability to get approved? So as long as she's been, uh, she has enough of a two week pay stub with new job, you'll be able to, to get a loan with that income, no problem at all. <laughs> he said, you're so cute, are you single? I am single and I appreciate the, uh, Appreciate the compliment. I'll do my best not to blush on here. Um, do you see USDA rates going up or down in the next six months? Um, I think they're going to trend with all interest rates. I personally think interest rates are going to go up slowly. Um, I don't believe they're going to go down much, much further. Uh, is this live? Yes, this is live. Um, the only... So when you ask, is this live? Yes, it's live. But like, for instance, right now it's it's 9.57 and you ask this at 9.40. So like, I'm just that far behind in comments. So I'm trying my best to like catch up to your live comments, but I'm a little backlogged <laughs> on how many comments I'm trying to respond to. Um, when you get a second job, how much pay stubs would be required for the new job? So to qualify for income on a second job, you need to have that job for two years. Okay, then after the two year requirement, they're going to want to see the past 30 days of your pay stub. Um, is it normally 20% for equity loans? Uh, most of the time, each lender is going to be different, but um, check with like a local credit union. They're going to be your best bet for, a, for an equity loan. Um, you have a question regarding mentorship. How do you know when your mentorship is no longer working? And I see in some of your other comments, uh, you're wondering how to approach this with your brokerage without stepping on someone's toe. So you've been in the industry for two years and not talk with your mentor for three months. Yeah. So it sounds like maybe you're at the point where it might be time to, to branch off on your own. And if so, then that's, that's not stepping on people's toes at all. Um, I don't think you have to word it in the sense like, Hey, this isn't necessarily working out, but um, if you feel like you're ready to outgrow who you're currently working with, 
um, then have that conversation with the brokerage and say like, hey, I'm ready to take on some more responsibility and, and move into this position on my own a little bit more um, and see maybe what they're, use that as a way to open that dialogue um, more than just stating the problem. Um, I'd kind of come at it with how you can present a solution as well. Um, Carolyn, you said, thanks for answering my question. You are welcome. I meant to say the lender for the FHA loan, not the lender for the new house. Um, oh, no, you don't have to tell that lender uh, for the FHA loan. Um, you don't have to tell them at all. Uh, so that's no problem. Henry, you said your videos rock. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. What is a good rate for first time home buyer jumbo loan on 75% loan to value? Um, for jumbo, I'm anticipating you'd be in the high 2% to low 3% range. Um, non lending question What streaming software are you using? I am using StreamYard. Um, I like it. Uh, there's so much other like software that has more features, but this is the easiest streaming software. And I just frankly don't want to mess around with all the features of all the other stuff. Um, personally, uh, do commercial property purchases account towards your personal DTI? No, only the ones that are on your credit report that actually are uh, your personal debts are going to count towards your debt to income ratio. I keep hearing noises up front. That makes me a little concerned. Sometimes people drop off rent checks at the front door over there and it makes a strange noise when things drop in that box. Um, is it possible to qualify for a home loan with a 635 middle score? Sure bet it is. Um, yep, FHA is probably your best route, uh, best route there. Um, how do you recommend realtors in different states? So I recommended someone who never reached out to you. Oh man, that's a bummer. So when I recommend realtors, normally what I do um, is I look them up in uh, our Remax database. So my dad's a Remax broker. So we can see that database there. I normally go off of uh, years of experience and then I try to either text or call that realtor just to kind of pre-vet them. So um, feel free to shoot me an email and then I can see if we can reconnect you with somebody else. Um, is the catch with USDA loan that you can only have on USDA and front end is hmm, hmm, hmm. shoot it's in the 30s I can't remember off the top of my head um, but no it is a little bit higher than 30 percent where's the T man I finished the T earlier I think it's oh no it's still a little bit left I think it's cold now Um, how soon after getting an FHA loan can I refinance to get rid of PMI? So you're going to need 5% equity in there to refinance into a conventional loan. Um, and you'll need to be in the home for about six months uh, at minimum. Um, what's the best way to show appreciation for an excellent realtor? Uh, that's a great question. Um, number one is... A, a review. If you can review them on all the sites that they're on, that's super helpful. So like Zillow, Google, if they have something on Yelp, if they have something on Facebook, you can just copy and paste one review to all those places. Um, but that's super helpful for a realtor. Normally people don't leave rev like reviews um, and having reviews helps realtors a lot uh, be able to show up to more people and work with more people. So that, and then if you're looking to like give them a gift, then I would just ask them, you know, is there like a favorite restaurant you like or um, trying to think what else? Yeah, it's probably a good option. What's a good restaurant that you like to go to? Crystal, you said I discovered your channel 20 minutes ago. Well, awesome. I'm glad you're here. Let me know if you have any questions. And if you've already asked, then um, I'll answer them here soon. And I'm going to try my best to catch up to these questions here. Uh, I am a little backlogged on these. Do commercial purchases account towards your personal DTI? Uh, no, they do not. Um, uh, 
you live in Chicago. We have a second highest property tax. I want to start a rental property, but worried about high taxes. Would you recommend a relocation to Indiana? I think it's always worth exploring lower cost uh, entry areas um, in investing um, than some of these areas with high property taxes. I can't really speak to your exact situation. I don't want to recommend, you know, you relocating or you basing your opinion of relocating based on me um, because I, I don't know you and you don't know me. So I don't want to give you a recommendation on you up and moving your family somewhere. Um, but it's definitely worth uh, something to explore. So I think Bank of America is a good mortgage lender for first time buyer. Uh, I have no experience with them. Um, I am hesitant with banks. Uh, I feel like banks can be a little bit slow and difficult to work with people. That perception could be wrong. Um, but I think it's worth talking to several different lenders to see which one's going to be a good fit for you. So if you encounter problems, you're going to, you're going to have a good gut feeling of, um, who's going to be the better lender to work with for you. Um, Lene, you said my credit score is 670, trying to get a conventional loan. The house is 300,000 and I'm putting 20% down. My lender stated FHA interest rate would be cheaper monthly than conventional but PMI. Um, yeah, so most likely what's happening here is the lender is only looking at your interest rate and not looking at the total cost. So when we do loan comparisons, we do what's called a total cost analysis. And what this actually shows you is what's the real cost with everything included, not just the interest rate. Because in this situation, just because you get a lower interest rate, you're right, like you have mortgage insurance. Um, so I would need to put it into an actual calculator to see but just guessing off the top of my head, conventional is probably your better option uh, in total cost savings, even if an interest rate is higher. Um, because often conventional loans have a higher interest rate than FHA loans do. But since they don't have the uh, ex as expensive mortgage insurance and the upfront mortgage insurance, they're cheaper even with a higher interest rate. Oh, and a, a quick way you can tell this too is um, if they give you a loan estimate uh, on page three, it should tell you the total cost uh, over five years. So compare the loan estimates that way to see kind of a five-year analysis. Um, all right, so you said we're in the process of paying off our credit card balances looking to purchase. May of 21, is it a good idea to pay off every credit card to a zero balance before applying for a loan? Um, yeah, this kind of depends on your debt to income ratio and if you need to pay them all down. Um, just from a f general financial perspective, paying down your credit card is going to save you money because you're not going to pay interest on it. Um, as far as it affecting your loan, having a small balance versus having zero balance isn't going to play a factor in you getting qualified for a mortgage. However, having a large balance compared to no balance is going to make a big impact because having a large balance is going to increase your debt to income ratio, which is going to lower how much you can purchase or how much you can qualify for. Um, are you ever going to be licensed in PA? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to, in the near future, no. Uh, it, it's difficult to get licensed in a bunch of individual states and then you have to maintain like uh, continuing education and all of them as well. It's a real drag. <laughs> I wish there was like one federal license. Um, is it true that after you've been approved for a loan and before closing, it's not a good idea to continue to pay off credit card balances as it could lower your credit score? So um, your lender is only going to use not only the lender most of the time, I would say 90% of the time is only going to use the credit report they pulled initially. So they're going to use that credit score. They're most likely going to do a soft pull bef immediately before you close, but the soft pull doesn't check your score. It only checks, did you take out new debt? So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. A good idea, general rule of thumb is like, keep all of your finances in kind of a general holding pattern um, during the mortgage process and then do all your paying off and and changing imbalances afterwards. I think that's going to be your better your better process. Um, you're not going to lose anything by waiting a, a couple more weeks to pay off uh, the credit card, um, unless there's like a specific reason that, that you need to. 
on closing cost lender and broker how much do they get um so it depends on what type of model uh each uses but for instance like a a lender most likely uh on average is probably getting um well, the, the actual legal limit is 3%, but most lenders are going to charge anywhere around the 2% range. So let's say like 2.5% of a loan. Um, and who pays that? It's actually the person who purchases the loan on the secondary market. So like on a $100,000 house, a lender would be getting paid $2,500 from whoever purchases the loan and then packages it into a mortgage-backed security. So that's someone like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Um, and then the actual loan officer or broker then they're going to get a split from that negotiated with the company. So it depends brokerage to brokerage, but you'll see anywhere from, uh, you know, like 70 bips, which is a hundredth of a percentage point. So um, 0.7% uh, all the way up to, you know, 225 bips. It really just depends on, you know, different models and how they're being set up. Sounds like there's someone up there. Um, what are your thoughts on a 2021 housing crash? I don't think we're going to see a housing crash. Um, we have a solid foundation with uh, mortgages where 2008 was like really bad loans. So I think we'll see a correction in prices um, and we are in a recession, but I don't think we'll see a crash like we did in 2008. Okay. Uh, is it absurd to do a final negotiation on the closing day? Um, yeah, I guess it depends on what you're negotiating. If you're negotiating like purchase price and stuff, things that are going to affect your loan, then you're not going to be able to close that day. Um, I mean, technically you can do it as long as it's not going to affect the loan, because if it's going to affect the loan, it has to be sent into an underwriter. Um, but if it's smaller things, then it wouldn't matter too much. And I'm going to be right back and see why I hear voices up front. All right, so it turns out I'm either losing my mind or the office is haunted because <laughs> there is no one here. Um, fun, fun stuff. Cool, so we've been at it for about almost two and a half hours. Um, here, I'm going to throw, uh, throw my email in here. Someone asked for that. Um <laughs> You said my wife hasn't slept with me in years. This is a bad idea to get a mortgage with her. And that is a personal question that I should not give you advice on. Um, maybe, maybe see a marriage counselor. That might be more helpful than a mortgage. Um, personally. Um, cool. So. Let me make sure, look through these last comments here. So I am so, um, <laughs> oh man, there's some funny comments that I missed in here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to hop off here. I know that I wasn't able to, uh, to get to everybody's questions. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to email them to me or comment on a video and um, and I will reply to them. Um, so I didn't skip out on you on purpose, I promise. 
uh, comment on another video and I'll be able to answer that question there for you. But um, you will have a wonderful night. We've been here for two and a half hours. I want to go sleep a little bit. And I also want to get out of this haunted office because I feel like I'm in like a horror movie right now. <laughs> so you'll have a good night and uh, I'll talk to you soon.